I want to know, have you ever seen the rain? I want to know, have you ever seen the rain? Coming down a sunny day. Did it do 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 do? Well, we tried to get the charging system to work on the Cranbrook, and didn't it didn't work. I mean, mechanically and visually, the bike actually is set up pretty nice, and it looks good. I'm happy with it, but unfortunately, we're just gonna have to run it off a 12 volt battery. Not a big deal. I mean, people who run electric bikes have to plug in every once in a while, and even running these tiny little lights on this thing means we're hardly ever gonna have to plug it in anyways. Uh, but we took a lot of footage working on the bike, didn't want it to go to waste, so you guys are gonna get a bonus pre-Friday video because who doesn't enjoy just seeing some work done to a motorized bike. Now we did learn a few things throughout the entire mess, that's what I'm going to call it. It was a mess, uh, but unfortunately I left that project being more confused than informed. Uh, whereas I learned a few things, there were some weird things going on with a bike that just didn't make sense to me. So maybe they'll make sense to some of you guys who know more about, um, you know, the ignition system on two strokes than I do. Uh, so yeah, I'm definitely not at all qualified to talk about how this works. You guys are just going to enjoy me trying to get it working and the frustrations that were uh, a result of that situation. Anyways, uh, so we're going to work on it and then we're going to ride it and then we're going to go to the comment sections to reply to some of your guys' comments. Uh, there's going to be some bits of useful information in there, a few things we haven't talked about yet, I think. Yeah, anyways, bonus video. Enjoy. We got something in the mail today. Input from eight to 40 volts, output 12 volts, three amps. It's a little bigger than I thought it was gonna be, but that's still a heck of a lot smaller than the battery. And it's waterproof, at least it claims to be. Okie dokie. Set that on the work table, please. Thank you. Oh, so fuzzy. We could go for a ride today, Dad. We could go for a ride. We could go for a ride today. <laughs> Most of my bike is held together by Velcro. Wires on these input leads. Oh, I still have a full container. Too big. Where's the loop? There it is. That's the right one. Oh, I'm shaky today. I just woke up. Tin that wire. All right. We need to make it longer and leave it that way. I think this one will work. Yeah. Oh. Mmm. Juicy. Oh. Not bad. Thank you, baby. A smaller one. I feel like this wire is just a little too thick. This is generic, cheap wire. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the difference is with the actual internal wire, but this silicone wire is incredibly flexible. This stuff you can just you can flex it all day long. It's, it withstands vibrations a lot better, so it's good on the motor. Um, but this stuff is real stiff. And if you bend it back and forth too many times, it gets metal fatigue and it breaks. Most of these Chinese components come with the cheap wire. So if you can use silicone wire, then at least you know on your, on your end, you did everything you could. So I want to trim down all these wires, and I'm going to, I promise. I'm going to make this look pretty. Uh, but until we make sure the stabilizer works, much like we did with the battery, uh, I'm not going to waste my time on it, because if it doesn't work, then well, I just did all that prettiness for nothing. Every time you set your solder down, and if you use it a lot during one project, make sure you put it through a sponge, a copper sponge. Clean the tip. When I first started soldering, I didn't know anything about soldering, and I, I kept destroying the solder tips on my cheap solder guns. And I just thought it was because they were cheap. It's not. It's because I just bought a soldering iron and soldered. I didn't buy anything else. If, if nothing else, when you get a soldering kit, get one of these uh, copper sponges. Okay, they're real cheap and they last for damn near ever. You can take the bottom off, empty it out. This is my original one I've used to build 
like 20 drones and five bikes. My second tip would be that before you solder or desolder anything, and after you cleaned it, put a little bit of solder on the tip. This will help quite a bit in soldering the new components or desoldering. It helps transfer the heat much faster. Another advantage is silicone wires. The silicone is more resistant to heat than the plastic insulator they use on the cheap wire. So you can actually hold these for a relatively long amount of time before it gets really hot. I was able to solder that two inch piece of wire without burning myself. I want to make sure that the solder on both ends of the wire is completely melted before we take away the heat. If you don't, you leave some of it that's still solid and some of it that's liquid. You get what's called a cold solder joint. Those are more susceptible to break under vibration or just moving the wire around. Sometimes when you solder, <coughs> this usually happens after you've had to keep the heat on for longer than uh, longer than you wanted to to get something to solder together. You'll get these little sharp bits. From what I understand, that happens as the flux begins to evaporate out of the solder. See, the most solder you buy like this has rosin core. It's got a little tiny bit of flux that runs down the middle of it. The flux is what helps things solder together really easily. But it, it has a boiling point, <clears throat> which means that it evaporates pretty quick. So if you're not able to solder something together real quick, you lose your flux and your solder doesn't want to stick to itself and the wire as easily. You can still solder things without it, it's just not as effective. And one of the, the things that that causes once the flux runs out is you get those sharp edges as you pull your solder gun away. Those sharp edges are real good at poking through a heat shrink. So you want to get rid of those if you can. I'm pretty certain that red coming off the magneto is positive. If that's not positive, if the red coming off of this magneto I bought is not positive, I'm going to lose my mind. Oh, you got to be shitting me. <laughs> you know what? That's why I started the camera, because I thought it'd be funny as if that happened. But I really didn't think it was going to happen. <laughs> Red is positive. We kind of knew that, but we had to make sure. Which means blue is positive. Why they have to put blue wires on a CDI doesn't make a lot of sense. It could be red and black, like, you know, the universal color code of the world. But hey, China, you want to twist your wires? You do this for two reasons. One, obviously it helps prevent them from fraying as you're working on components. And two, it helps remove air pockets so the solder can engulf the wire more freely. Woo! Woohoo! <laughs> you guys, soldering irons are hot. <laughs> I figure she's ready for a test ride. At this point, when we start the bike, all the electronics should work. Well, time to do some troubleshooting. Okay, so here's what's going on so far. If I disconnect the kill switch circuit, which includes the converter, the bike will run. But the moment I reconnect it, the engine dies. got to be a magneto that we can put in this bike which can supply some amperage but essentially anything kills the motor uh, if you suspected that these magnetos could not supply any additional voltage congratulations you were right honestly I expected they could supply something but quite literally anything added to the circuit is causing the motor to die 
Up until this point during the testing phase, I had been using the aftermarket magneto I purchased off of Amazon because it claimed to be high performance 12 volts. And part of the troubleshooting phase, I decided to go ahead and test the stock magneto that came with the motor. Because it had the white wire, I assumed that it might have some auxiliary power connection or a separate coil. Well, after closer examination, it turns out that the white wire that comes in these kits is literally just soldered to the same terminal as the blue wire, meaning that this is not going to help at all. But if you were curious, now you know. So here's the new magneto. This is the one we just bought. And uh, we just went ahead and took it out. We're going to put the old one back in and uh, see if we have any different results. So this is how you want a magneto to look. See the plates? See how they all look crisp and clean? This is the new one we just took back out of the bike after we've been riding it for a couple of days. You don't see any rubbing. When you replace a magneto, it's important that you shim it. And this is how I do it. If you don't shim it, then the, uh, the magnet will rub on the stator. I believe these are the stators. And it'll actually eat into it, which just isn't good. I take a piece of paper, this is three layers of printer paper, and I just wrap it around the uh, magnet in there. After I install the magneto. So these are all loose, these nuts are all loose. So I go ahead and put the magneto in, wrap this with a couple layers of paper, and now we can go ahead and tighten down all the screws. If you don't shim it when you install this, what will happen is the magnet will actually pull the stator onto it and then you'll basically you'll just wear it away real quick there we go I have to look at other options, I guess. Well, at the very least, after all this, I made my horn louder. <laughs> If you guys are lost, don't worry, I'm going to bring you up to speed at what's going on in the video right now. So at the moment, you're seeing me install a 12-volt generator coil. It's an auxiliary coil that supplies its own voltage, which is designed to work with halogen bulbs. And for its intended purpose, I think it will work just fine, but we'll get into that in a moment. Up until now, I first tried to use the voltage stabilizer, converter, regulator, whatever you want to call it, and that didn't work at all. Uh, just being plugged into the circuit wouldn't let the engine run. And then we took that out of the equation and tried to run the electronics directly off of the magneto without any kind of stabilizer in between. And although the lights would then flicker, they would come on, they would immediately kill the motor the moment I tried to operate any of them. So I figured by using this coil, we could get dedicated voltage, which wouldn't interfere with the CDI or magneto whatsoever. And this did work, and it didn't. One, there's a weird anomaly, which you guys are going to see pop up in a little bit, which I still cannot figure out for the life of me why this happens. And two, uh, it won't work with LEDs. When I purchased it, because of my own ignorance, I just assumed it was going to supply a 12 volt DC volt, um, current, to direct current. Uh, it wasn't until I tried to do troubleshooting and dug deeper into the information about these coils that I learned they supply alternating current. And if you guys know anything about LEDs, you know that they don't run off of alternating current. Well, they'll run off of half of it, which is why they flickered, but they won't run off of the other half. That's why pretty much every LED that you screw into a fixture at your house has its own built-in ballast at the base of the bulb. LEDs need direct current. They're polarized. Uh, these coils that I'm installing in the motor right now, which are designed for these motors, they'll work with halogen balls because halogens will work off of alternating current. They don't care. 
which direction the current flows they simply take it and they heat up and they produce light which is why I think that this would work with halogen headlight a halogen tail light and even I believe halogen flashers uh, which vehicles have used for a long time but to get it to work with the LEDs I would need to also purchase um, another converter basically a converter that takes the alternating current and converts it into direct current and at that point I just got tired of buying stuff to get this to work and decided we're just gonna go ahead and use the battery the battery was working it wasn't giving me any issues and with a little bit of waterproofing I think the battery will last a long time which is what we did okay I think that brings us up to speed now you're just going to see me fiddle around with this for a little bit and then you're going to see this weird thing that happens with the bike when I tried to run this coil. Okay, so we have the battery off right now. Let's see, no horn, no blinkers, no stoplight. All right now we turn the battery on and make sure the circuits are still working. <laughs> All right, cool. And we got our tail light, running light. Good. Turn signals. Yep, yep. All right. Okay, so uh, everything's still working on the battery. That's good. All right, we'll turn the battery back off. Trying to fish that switch out of there. Hello. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So no battery. So hopefully. When we fire up the motor, we'll get something. <laughs> better than last time <laughs> I was actually able to run some electronics without the motor dying it's very anemic in the electricity department but I think we can use that to charge the battery which is better than nothing ideally I wanted to run this without a battery at all I just wanted um, a little generator that had enough juice to run all these low-powered electronics but unfortunately that's uh, proving to be difficult. I'm not going to say it's impossible. If we use the battery to power the electronics, much like a capacitor, it'll have the power it needs to supply on demand while the generator slowly charges it. But what I need to do now is I need to see what the voltage output from the generator is. <laughs> What did I just do? The generator only has this red wire that goes, this red wire here, goes straight to the generator, doesn't connect to anything else, it doesn't go to the CDI, magneto, just from the generator to the electrical system for the lights and the horn. But it doesn't connect to anything that runs the bike. So unplugging that should not have turned off the motor. Uh, hopefully that was just a a fluke motor <laughs> decided that was when it was going to stall. Okay, that doesn't make any sense at all. What the hell? This is so weird. It's so. It's so. It, 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 um, this is a. Unfortunately, at this point, I was out of time and I had to go to work. But I figured since the motor was running, I would take a chance and do the five minute ride to work. If I broke down for some reason, it's a short walk. So this is something that was supposed to be incredibly simple, turned very complicated. I cannot figure it out. So I'm going to tell you guys what I know, 
and a few theories about why it's doing what it's doing. So first off, the motor will only run if the battery pack is plugged in. And this is strange for a number of reasons. First, it doesn't matter if the battery is turned on or turned off, only that it's plugged in. Second, the generator only has one wire, the positive connection. And that positive connection connects directly to the battery pack. The battery pack, as well as all of the electronics that I added to the bike, are an isolated circuit, meaning that they only get their power from the battery, they don't ground to the frame, they don't ground to the motor. However, the coil, the generator coil that we added to the motor, doesn't have a negative wire. It grounds through the motor, which in turn can ground through the frame, which means that I can get my negative connection from the generator to the battery on any solid metal surface of the bike. I just so happen to be using one of the CDI's negative connections or what I assume is a negative connection. But I don't see how this would interfere with anything because it's not completing a circuit to the charging system or to the ignition system of the bike. Basically, I removed the positive wire completely. I desoldered it from the generator and the bike would still not run. So, I assume that there is some kind of interference from the generator coil that is affecting the magneto. Even though there's not a complete circuit, this doesn't make sense to me. And another theory which might help support that is when it's plugged in, it'll run. And I assume that's because this battery pack has a protection circuit. The protection circuit protects the batteries from overcharging, under voltage and reverse polarity. And I think the reverse polarity is the important part because it might be taking away whatever interference is caused by the generator coil while it's plugged in. And when you unplug it, that interference is brought back into the system. Guys, I know that's incredibly difficult to picture. I'm the one who put this together and I still can't picture that in my mind. Anyways, I'm sure there's an electrician out there that could take five minutes looking at this bike and figure it out right away. but. I'm just going to leave it at that. That was too confusing for me, so I took the coil back out of the motor and we are just running it off the battery. This project is done. I'm not dealing with that anymore. It was just so simple to do what a lot of commenters suggested and just use a battery. impressed with these vinyl stickers. Miles on the odometer so far. So 35 miles since she's had the electronics. A hell of a lot more than that on that motor though. Hey guys, welcome back to the comment section. This is the part of the video where people have the misconception that I know a lot about these motors. Well, I've gathered some information over the past three years of riding these bikes, but I'm not a know-it-all. Primarily, an entertainer. Which is why I reply to these the best I can, but I also rely on a lot of you guys to help out some of the other viewers. So if you come across any of these comments that we're going to go over and you know the answer, feel free to chime in in the comments. Alright. I really 
like that color. You guys want to talk about motivation to make more videos, JJ just nailed it right there. <laughs> That's awesome, man. These bikes are a good way to keep you off the streets and out of trouble. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe they keep you on the streets and in trouble, but it's, it's a different kind of trouble. So Becky here had a couple questions about the bike and the dog. I'm going to just go over what I answered to her more in detail. Now with Henry here, he's a smooth coat border collie. Very uh, energetic dog with a lot of stamina. He gets to go out once every week if the weather permits. Um, I wouldn't really classify him as a trail dog with once a week trail rides, but it's a lot more than most dogs get. Anyways, I haven't pushed it with him to try and find what his limit is, but here's what I can tell you. I haven't found it yet. He's got a limit. It's somewhere way above what probably the motor is. <laughs> he can probably out uh, stamina the bike. Anyways, the, the bike's top speed, just the trail bike, on flat ground is 22 miles an hour according to the GPS. Uh, now, depending on trail conditions, when I'm going through what we have out here, it's between 12 and 18 miles an hour. That's uh, not a really fast bike, but He's a hell of a lot faster than the bike, and he has no problem reminding me of that anytime he sees a squirrel or a deer. Mike Brink made a suggestion that might actually prolong the life of the Path Dragon. I'm still planning on upgrading. I've decided what we're probably going to do is go with the YD100 motor. I've had a lot of comments from a handful of people who really want me to test out that motor, and I wouldn't mind trying it. Uh, that extra torque would be really nice out on the trails, but I'm gonna get that motor with uh, the Swin Taf, the 2020 Swin Taf. More on that later. We gotta make sure it's gonna fit first, but that is the motor at the very least. Biggest issue I've had with Path Dragon, uh, I think Mike read my mind, is I have to true the wheel like every couple of rides. I have to take the rear wheel and I have to retrue it. I've never broken a spoke and they're not bending it's just they're so thin I knew when I built the bike from day one that these were super thin spokes and I have no idea how they have lasted so long but I've never broken a single one but he suggested just buying thicker spokes I've never re-spoked a, a wheel and I'm kind of intimidated about that but I figure for the price and the fact that we're gonna be replacing the bike anyways I might as well just buy them, buy a set, try and put them on and just see if it works. I want to highlight uh, Dubnium's comment, sorry if I said your name wrong, but uh, some of you guys might be able to help him out. Anyways, uh, his comment was on my latest video, uh, Motorized Bikes Are Fun. He's suffering a power loss with a lot of carbon buildup. He's looking for suggestions. Um, Personally, I'm pretty bad at reading the symptoms of motors and really when it's not running right, I just start fiddling with a whole bunch of stuff, usually starting with the carburetor and the needle positions and then uh, the type of gas I'm using and then I start looking for air leaks and that's what I do and so far that's worked, but I haven't run into nearly every possible situation so there's a lot of that I don't know. I mean, uh, spark plug gap maybe. Um, ignition timing, like the, you can actually reposition the uh, the magnet on the motor for timing. I'm not suggesting that that's a problem. I'm just saying that there are a few other things which I haven't really dealt with yet that could cause power loss. Um, so if you guys think you might be able to help him out, go for it. And Dumnium, <laughs> I hope I say that right. If you can uh, post up a video, I haven't checked, I don't know if you have already, but if you can post up a video of uh, your motor, you know, um, mainly with good audio, you know, uh, let us hear what it sounds like, both at idle, when you rev it, when you're riding it, uh, if you can do that. Uh, like I said, the audio is the more important thing. The video doesn't have to be really great, but the audio is more important. Uh, that might help a lot of us help you. Playing with Fire wants to know where I found a one-inch hub adapter, clamp-on hub adapter, and I just I got it off Amazon. Literally, I think I just searched for one-inch motorized bike hub adapter. Uh, but it looks like this one has a spacer here. Fits one inch or one and a half inch. And you guys see this is the Super Moto Parts 1 inch 
slash 1.5 inch CNC adapter 30, 38 tooth sprocket. A uh, shout out to Mark's comment simply because it reminded me of something very important. He broke down in Florida and almost got eaten alive by mosquitoes and that reminded me to put bug spray in my backpack. A Midnight Rider racer, he's surprised that my bike's still running. This was a comment on the last video where we got really wet riding through some pretty gnarly stuff. Um, and I'm actually bringing this up because this reminds me of something I want to test out. Um, there's a lot of paranoia about getting water underneath the cover that protects your magneto. Uh, people assume that uh, that's going to short out your magneto or CDI or whatever. Um, now, I'm not going to say that that's not possible, but I don't believe that it's actually the water's direct contact with the magneto and stator that causes damage. See, the magneto is literally just a coil wire wrapped around um, a stator, two stators and those sit on the outside of a rotating magnet. Um, there's no electrical component in there which would become immediately damaged by water. I know this from working with drones. And yes, there are some similarities here. Because uh, there was the same paranoia with these motors for a lot of people um, until we just became more familiar with them. Now, inside this motor, is no moving parts other than the bearing and the shaft that goes through it. There's coil wires wrapped around stators. They're energized and it moves a magnet. It's the reverse of what's going on inside the motor with a few variations. But these can get wet. You can completely submerge these brushless motors in water and they'll work just fine. Where the damage can happen I believe is corrosion. If you were to dunk your motor and not drain the water out of that compartment, so water gets up in there through the wire loom or the wire bushing or whatever and it doesn't drain out or maybe it drains out but um, it's still it's gonna stay moist in there for a long time. Not all the water is ever gonna evaporate out of there. Uh, that's where you would start to get corrosion on the contact points. Maybe some minor arcing through the corrosion um, to the casing of the motor. That is where uh, damage could probably happen. But just getting the magneto itself wet, you're literally you're just getting a coil and a magnet wet that uh, won't cause any damage in and of itself. A little clarification about the trail bike when we removed the derailleur, yes, uh, it ran absolutely fine on just a single speed with no derailleur. I did get lucky with the chain tension uh, and the alignment um, because there's a lot of different ones you can try and put it on, it's not going to work on all of them. Um, but word of warning, you may only want to remove the derailleur if you have to. If you're using a bike that doesn't have a hanger, it's a little part that goes between the frame and between the derailleur. It's a separate piece that you can buy separately. If your bike doesn't have one of those and you you tweak the derailleur, it usually bends the frame at that point. It doesn't trash the whole frame, but it trashes that part of it. Putting another derailleur on might be possible, but it's, it's never going to be the same. Anyways, that's what I did the first time. First time we messed up a derailleur, I went ahead and bent that part of the frame back and put another one on, and it worked. It wasn't perfect. There were a few parts of the cassette where it just it wouldn't stay in a certain gear, but I settled on like gear three and just never changed it. The only thing I was actually using the derailleur for itself is a chain tensioner. <laughs> It's just a really heavy, complicated chain tensioner. I'm so glad it worked out that I was able to get rid of it, but I don't suggest doing it unless you have to because your bike's been damaged as like a last resort because I got really lucky with that chain just working perfect tension, perfect alignment, no pro no problems. That was like this unheard of in motorized bike stuff. So a viewer here is curious how far I can go on the trail bike without actually taking a break for the motor. Um, Really, I'm not sure. I haven't tested it to see how far I can go before taking a break, and I wouldn't know how to do that safely, you know? It's just like, just go. 
<laughs> until the motor stops working. Uh, doesn't seem like a really good way to test that. Um, but I can tell you how far I have gone and the longest trail ride I took, um, I actually have a video I just cut it a lot because it was too long but it was just over 10 miles it was literally 10 miles of just straight riding about half of that was on road just getting to the trail and then the other was straight onto the trail and go and then we turn around and came back didn't take a break the whole time the motor ran that 10 miles no problem and that was a wide variation of different speeds and terrain um, which I believe is actually better than just one solid speed um, from what I understand could be wrong about this I just read it in the Zeta manual is these motors are not designed to run at a constant speed um, they like to have variations in throttle inputs and uh, RPMs and whatnot that's why I, I think these work really well as a trail bike because uh, just the constant change in speed and the fact that you're not just running straight for a long period of time um, personally if I was gonna run one of these street bikes for long distances I would Get, uh, get one of those big heads with a lot of cooling fins for more surface area. I would run richer, meaning that you'd sacrifice a little bit of power, but a richer mixture is cooler on the engine. Um, and I'd run a smaller rear sprocket. That would mean your bike is going to go faster at any given RPMs, which is going to add more air cooling to the motor. So yeah, um, a bigger head more cooling fins, a smaller rear sprocket to go faster for more air cooling, and a richer mixture which is just going to be better on the engine. So that would be my suggestion if you plan on running these bikes for long distances. There might be other things you can do to improve that, but uh, that's what I would do. Free Hugs thinks he might start doing videos. Keep an eye out. You might want to subscribe to him. He's got a lot of comments on my videos and then Looks like he's been doing motorized bike stuff for a while, but uh, just no videos yet. Really, I fully support this. We need more people making videos uh, simply because we need more information. We need more experience so we can all fix things when they break. All We can get ideas on how to go faster, be safer, more reliable. The more people who make videos, the more ideas will pop around the community. So, free hugs, good luck. I hope it works out for you, man. If you do make videos, let me know. Put a comment on something when you make a video. I'll go watch it. He also claims he's been running a Copper Core Autolite size 216 for two years with no problems. Thank you, Free Hugs. That's just another option we have to choose from. We do appreciate it. All right, we're going to finish this off with Fun for Change. He has a couple of questions here, which I'm going to try and answer a couple of them. Not going to get to all of them. Sorry, buddy. All right, so um, links for replacement parts and upgrades, other cool stuff. Like, um, I don't have any affiliate links. I'm not sponsored. I make zero off of anything. Um, but uh, as far as where I get replacement parts, um, <laughs> look, if I can't get it off Amazon, I usually just don't get it. I'm not giving a plug for Amazon. It's just that when I want to get something, it's really easy to get it from them. And lately, Walmart online has been uh, fulfilling Amazon's place in a lot of situations. But I mean, I look, you know, fuel filters, uh, AutoZone, O'Reilly's, Napa. I go and get a basic inline fuel filter because I don't, I, I don't see any reason to buy that online, and they're right down the street. Fuel line, Amazon. Gaskets, Amazon carburetors, Amazon inner tubes, Walmart. I like to use the Goodyear heavy duty ones. Tires, Walmart. Chains, Amazon or Walmart. Um, every electrical component on the bike, Amazon. <clears throat> I'm just, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of anything that I haven't bought off Amazon. I did get some exhaust gaskets from Zeta Motorsports. Comfort seat padding nope that was Amazon spoke truing tools that was Amazon low profile wrench set that was Amazon uh, replacement ball bearings well nope, that was also Amazon oh, we got pedals and yeah, we got the pedals from Amazon the cameras Amazon and a couple GoPros I got from Walmart camera mounting gear Amazon tire sealant Amazon that was when I was going tubeless Rear sprocket hub adapters, that was Amazon. Brakes, Amazon. Brake pads, Amazon. 
the replacement throttle cables from Amazon, clutch cables from Amazon. Look buddy, I just buy everything from Amazon. He has a question about vibration dampening motor mounts, kind of like what's used in cars and on generators and compressors. Maybe some motorcycles, none of mine have it, but I've uh, heard of it. Uh, anyways, I don't have first-hand experience trying it, but I've not done it because I've heard some bad things, and the things I hear about it make sense. There's um, a lot of things about motorized bikes which I don't, I don't take people's word for it. I like to see it in a manual or just to go get first-hand experience trying it myself, but doing the rubber vibration dampening motor mounts is something that I'm not going to try myself because um, of just my understanding of these motors. Okay, first off, these motors only have two mounting points to the bike unless you are making some kind of really specialty setup, okay? They, they mount at the bottom and they mount on the side towards the back. So they only have those two points. And those two points make a triangle. That's why it's a strong mount when it's a solid mount. Now, if you add any kind of rubber to those two points, now you have, uh, it's not really the right way to say it, but I'm just gonna say engine flex. When you give it gas, it will pull the motor to the left side of the bike. It'll actually try and pull it, okay? Now, these setups are already really picky about chains and chain alignment. Uh, a lot of you guys watching already know that it's pretty easy to get a chain lock up if any little thing is off in the system. And that's not even going over chain tension, how the chain would loosen and tighten as the motor would get pulled to one side and released. Um, the motor mounting on these motors for the bikes is minimal <clears throat> because it's kind of a jerry-rigged system and interrupting any part of it uh, is not good. Anyways, if you just take and loosen your like your rear mount, the, the mount on the down tube I think it's called, or the, the seat tube, the seat stay, anyways the mount on the back, which is probably the most important because it's the one that keeps the motor from rotating. If you just loosen that a little bit and try and ride the bike, it's going to sound weird, it's going to feel weird, and you might have a chain slip lockup or worse. Um, that might break. But that, um, that locks the motor in place. And if it gets loose, you can actually tap the motor with your palm and move it. You can, you can move the motor on these bikes really easy if they're not tight. Um, if you do try a vibration dampening system, I would love to see it if it works, but be very careful with it. Um, if you get your motor to the point where you start having a nice performance, good torque, and it really starts to pull the motor to the left side of the frame, you're going to run into some bad situations. But I will agree that if you can make it work, uh, it'll take a lot of stress off your frame, your hands, and your ass. Just the heck of vibration is just gonna be nice. There'll be less things coming loose and the welds on your bike will probably last quite a bit longer. Alright guys, so that's gonna cover it for this video. Hope you got some useful information out of it or at the very least entertainment. I'll see you in next Friday's video. Stay safe.